Well, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us again as we have our Bible study tonight, uh, as is a habit for so many of us. And I'm thankful for all of you who are here with me and you're allowing me to be with you, more importantly. And so on behalf of everyone on our team, on behalf of Will and Bobby here and Mike, who's working with us and helping us, we uh, guiding us, uh, Chris, the others. Uh, Brad has uh, decided to have surgery this week. I don't know. He didn't have anything better to do or something. So, so he's not able to be here tonight, but I'm sure that he's watching. And I'm sure that Carrie is waiting on him hand and foot, you know, because he's, he's kind of out of it. So we're praying for you to get better, Brad. We're looking forward to that. We're again glad that everybody is here with us tonight. And I see already that we have a lot of you. You're from all over, and that is very exciting. I want to, before we get started, I do want to give you a report uh, uh, from Mike Domke, the missionary that we talked with uh, last week when we did the Bible study, which was really cool. I mean, I think it was that we got to talk with him live. Uh, of course, if you were not with us, Mike and Julianne, friends for a long time with Don and I, and we worked together for many years and still obviously still know each other, but they are missionaries in Kiev, Ukraine. And so they had to evacuate from Kiev and they were in Budapest, and so we were able to connect with, with him and talk with him live there in Budapest about what was going on. And so just to give you a word, I spoke with him, saw him and spoke with him uh, through video today. And they are still in Budapest. Uh, they are safe. They are okay. Uh, he said they're busy every day doing a number of things. The uh, kids are going to school. They're working that all out somehow. And so, of course, they have a number, a fairly large contingent of missionaries that are there together. So they're doing okay. And he thanks those of you that have emailed him. And so he appreciates that very, appreciates that very much. And so we'll try to reconnect uh, with him once they get back and we find out, kind of get an update on what's going on there. Uh, looking forward to when they can get back uh, to Kiev and do the work. Uh, tonight we're gonna we're gonna pray and ask God's blessing on our study. And uh, before we do, you want to get your Bible and make sure you have that ready. And so I know some of you may use uh, digital versions of the Bible, and 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 I have to do that. I have a program uh, here on my computer that I have to live with uh, every single week, and it's got more stuff on it than you'd ever. It's the Lamborghini of Bible study things, but I still like uh, the the physical paper printed bound copy just for me and would prefer books that way, but it's, you know, so whichever you like, uh, but uh, that I have to use both. I choose to use one, I have to use the other. So I hope that you have a Bible with you so we can study together. If you're taking some notes, uh, whether you are putting those down digitally or by pen and ink or whatever you're doing, then you want to get ready to do that as we're going to study together. So, but before we do, let's pray together. Father God, we pray now that you would just bless our time. We pray, Father, that we'll come together, and even though we're separated by distance, that you would unite us, Lord, in the Spirit. And Father, there's, a, there's just so much going on uh, in the churches and in people and everything else right now and all kinds of things. God, we need you to unite us and bring us together, united in the common bond of Christ as brothers and sisters, and united around the Word of God and to learn what your Word says. So Father, let us focus on that, not on imposters, on what people say that might be your word, but what your word really says. Help us tonight as we're studying about missions, we're studying in the book of Acts, to see that it's not just a story of the Apostle Paul and the others, but it's, it's a story of how you would use us, O oh God. And so open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to us. Give me the ability to say it clearly, I pray, and accurately, and give us all the ability to hear it not what I'm saying, but what the Spirit of God says. So we pray this, that it will all bring you glory this night. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, I hope you said amen with me. You remember that as we get toward the uh, end of the time together in our study, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, and I will do my best to answer those. You'll want to text those in or send those in through the website, or whichever plat however the platform is. And so then I will get those here. And so Mike on our staff, he's getting those and so forth and getting, getting them over to me. So, uh, but I cannot answer them if you don't ask them. So as it relates to the passage, the subject area that we're in tonight, and so I'll do my very best. All right. So I'll remind you of that in a few more minutes. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 17, and we're going to pick up midway in this chapter. 
And what happens, the reason you could do that in the book of Acts is, remember, the book of Acts is a, his, it's a history of what happened in the early church. And so it's written by Luke, the doctor, who we read uh, in the Gospel of Luke Sunday. So uh, Luke is writing this. He has assimilated uh, or compiled this history led by the Holy Spirit and using his abilities. And so he's compiled this history of the early church. And so in, this, in, the, uh, in the missionary journeys especially, we go from one place to another. So it kind of makes natural break points. Uh, so we're able to stop even midway sometimes in the chapters and do that. So we're in Acts 17, and we're going to start reading. in Actually, verse 10, he's already had to leave Philippi. He's gone to Berea. It talks about that. We covered that briefly last week. And then now we're in verse 16. Okay, so now he makes a major change in Acts 17, 16. While Paul, and it says, I'm going to read for us, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed. Waiting for who, by the way? Well, if you'll jump up before that, it says, those who, verse 15 says, those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Remember, the issue is they there was a there was a big brouhaha over there, and so they had to leave. They go to Berea, he goes to Berea, and they're still splitting them up for safety's sake. So he's gone on to Athens one way, the other two are going another way. They're going to meet up, but right now they haven't met up yet. So he's there first. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens for uh, Silas and Timothy, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue both with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where he, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and they would like to know, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Okay, so we're going to stop there for just a second, and let me help you out a little bit. So Paul has traveled to Athens. Okay, so let's let's quickly let's take a look. Let me show you where this is. So as you look on the map, so Paul was, as we recall, he was over here in Philippi. And so now he traveled all the way to Berea, as you see right here. And now he's gone all the way to Athens, which is right here. So it's a good little distance. So as you see, he's gone off the way, off sort of off the beaten path, or at least what we think was his direction. But he had to do that for the sake of safety, okay? So he's down in this area in Athens, in Achaia. Uh, which is this region, this whole area right here. So with that in mind, great. I will come back to some, some things to show you in just a minute. So he's left. He's gone down to this area. And so as he's gotten there, there, there's this big thing going on with philosophy there. And it really is a big deal. So there's the, the two schools, the Epicurean, the Stoics. And so the Epicureans believed, in essence, life was the espoused from their primary philosopher life is about pleasure and happiness and and everybody being happy whatever you want and so forth and so on they they, they would make good americans i think okay and then so then you have the stoics and in in a very 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 broad stroke fashion uh it's all about more intellectual and knowledge in us and this and that so there's one is pleasure one is we're going to know one is but at the end of the whole thing it's 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 a philosophy that's not unlike what is common today which is it's all about us and the world, the universe is going to be in control. And we want to respect is it is a very, we would call it a very new age philosophy, except that it was ancient back then, which is a very important thing to understand that philosophies today are not new. They're just repackaged. So when you hear something called new age, it's kind of a joke because it's not new. It's just refocused and repackaged and people think it's new. But this has worked very, very well. It's been an, uh, uh, an ar part of the arsenal of Satan for a long time to get people to feel good intellectually or feel good emotionally, and everything is all right. But, of course, it's not all right. So this was a big deal for them. And so as Paul is walking around, he's waiting on Timothy and Silas. They haven't gotten there. He's seen all these idols because, because that, was, that was Athens. They had a plethora of gods. 
and they they viewed themselves as highly intellectual, and and they were intellectual people, and it was a very accomplished area. We know this historically, their art, their culture, things like that, which are still amazing to this day in many ways. And so with all that in mind, they prided themselves on this. So they go to him, or, or they speak about him and say, what is this babbler trying to say? And the word that's translated babbler has the idea of, it's kind of silly, but it's, it, it, it could translate like a bird that's uh, uh, picking at something and picking up seed or something. It's like just pecking, you know, at something. So like he's annoying. You know, so it was, a, it was condescending, and yet it was, we're a little curious because they always love to talk and to hear about what was going on. By the way, some uh, historians have written about that, confirming that, that this is the way that it was in Athens. So it's not just this writing in the New Testament. There are others. It was widely known this is, this is kind of who they were and what they were about. So they invite him to come to an area uh, called the Areopagus, which is very, very interesting. And so that particular area, uh, uh, they, they invite him to go there. And I'll show you that in just a minute. But he's, he's able to go there and he's able to speak. That's a really big deal. It's a really big deal. So that would be like going to the, it's hard to explain. It would be, it, it was actually a court originally. And so it, was, it would be like going to the high court to argue your case. But it would also be like going to uh, a high level course, invited to be the guest speaker at an Ivy League university or something like that. It, it was kind of all that wrapped up in one. So it was very, very prestigious, but also very important for a specific reason. So It says, verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found, notice he said your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And in the New Testament, this is what this this passage is famous about. They were so religious, they were afraid they would offend a God that they didn't know the name of, so they actually created an altar to, an un, to the unknown God, to the one they don't know the name of, just, just to cover all the bases. You know, Not unlike today, people that say, you can believe whatever you want. I, want, I don't want to offend anybody, so I'll pray and believe everything. Kind of similar, a little bit. So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So what is he saying? He's saying, you have an altar to the unknown God. I'm going to tell you who he is. Well, that's brilliant from a speaking standpoint. So he really has their attention now. They're like, okay, who is this? So he's, he's, he's thrown, drawn a line in the sand, but it is a very excellent technique to a point. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Now keep in mind, there are, there are a multitude of temples where he's, where he's standing and doing this around. He does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself, lives, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, we're going to stop there for just a second. Let me back up and let me give you some idea here of, uh, of a couple of things here. First of all, let's get a context again. Now I'm going to go and show you some things. I've shown you this one map, but I want to show you something else for just a moment. Let's get an idea of where we are in the world. So here we are. So this is, again, you're looking at the area where in Turkey where he was. Remember, he's crossed across here, and then he's traveled all the way up and so into the Macedonian area. And so now he's come over, and this is Thessalonica right here, okay? 
And so that's where he was. And then here we have Athens where he is right now. Now, I know you're saying, well, why are you showing me all this? Because I think it's very easy for us to read these locations and we, we don't get any kind of indication of, of you know, where it is in the world and how this is working. And I think it helps us to understand these are real places. There were distances that had to be traveled and you had to get from point A to point B. We read this as if, oh, everything just happens like, you know, in the next hour. That's not exactly the case. So let me help you out here. Let's see how practical we can get. So we're going to do this one, and let me show you. We're going to zoom in on it a little bit, give you a little better idea. And so you'll recognize Italy there because, you know, half of you got family in Italy, it seems. So you'll see that's right over there. And so now you see Athens right here. Now let me show you a couple of things that you might find interesting. Okay, I don't know if you will, but you might. So if you want to know, all right, how far is this? How far did he travel from Thessalonica to Athens? How long does it take to get there? What you're looking at right here, that's the bus route right now for you to go from Thessalonica to, or what we would call Thessalonica to Athens. If you're going to travel by bus, it's the schedule of the bus is five hours and 45 minutes. Okay. By the way, it's going to cost you about 45 bucks to do that. All right. For that ticket, depending if you're going the whole thing, not a bad deal, really. So at least the last print that I have. Let me show you another one. Here's this one. All right. So let's say you want to go by ferry. There's a ferry trip right now today. You can buy a ticket and you can travel by ferry. Your ticket range is going to be $94 to $189 each. And so you're going to travel from Thessalonica and you're going to go all the way to Athens. However, as you can see, you're going to go around the world to get there, it seems. And so because of that, get this, if you drive, if you go on the ferry, it's going to take you 27 hours to make that trip. Maybe it's nice. I don't know, but it's going to take you a little while. Finally, let's say you don't want to do either one of those. No, instead, what you want to do is you want to fly. So you want to just give it a straight shot. Okay. You can fly. You can do that. It's not going to be too terribly expensive. Depending on the flight, it's going to be straight shot. It's going to be less than an hour, but with the connections, it's more like three hours. This is a long way for you to go. So again, why am I showing you this? Because I want you to understand that he didn't just drop in. This was an intentional thing. And if we go back to the original picture here, the thing I want you to understand is, see, he was going in a line. If you'll notice from, he, from here, he was going, look, almost a straight line. And that's because there was a major roadway built by the Romans in the second century BC, originally the Aegean Way, and that was the one I told you about before. That was like the highway, if you will, and it really was, that connected from the fertile ground in the Macedonian region to the ports. By all accounts, he was most probably planning to stay there and travel that way because it would make sense. Remember, God had called him by the vision to Macedonia. He'd gone to Philippi, but he, he had not been told, go to this city or this exactly that we know of. So that would be a good, good structure. That would make sense. But because of all the opposition and what happened, instead of staying on that straight line, what I want you to see is he went all the way down here. There, it's, it, it's questionable whether he ever intended to go there, to go to Athens. Now, we know God had a plan, but, the, but from his perspective, it doesn't seem that was ever part of the original plan. So he's taking a big detour, what appears to be a detour. We studied about detours already. So he's gone down quite a ways off that path, okay? And so then he's gotten to, he, or he ended up at the Areopagus. By the way, I'm going to show you one more thing, and that is uh, this. Let me show you here. Take that off. There we go. So this is the Areopagus, the hill, or it's called Mars Hill. And so in this picture of Athens, it's going to be right here, Okay. And so if you go there today, you're going to be able to stay there, stand on there. And that's where the foundation, where the courts were, or the, the, the A court was and a high court. It has a long history of everything. And when he says that God, when he talks about um, uh, that, he says in verse 24, uh, God, the, the God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. What you need to realize <laughs> is within sight of this, of that hill, okay, just within sight, uh, you have the Acropolis uh, on the mountain there. You have all of these temples to the gods that, the, uh, that they worshipped in Athens. They're right there. And so this picture is from the Acropolis, from that angle. So it's all very close. So when he stood there and he said that, they're on a, they're on a hill 
in Athens, they can see the most magnificent temples, you know, that were ever built. And yet he's saying that's not where he is. So it really was an impactful thing for him to say and for him to share. And it was a, it was a very, honestly, it was a very gutsy thing for him to do at that point. It really, really was. So with that in mind, there you go. Just to kind of help you get a visual. And even today, by the way, as I show you, I mean, Athens is a big place. I mean, you have a lot of homes. You got a lot of stuff there. But, but these were real places, and they still are. They're still there. You could still go and walk there where he made, theoretically, where he made this presentation. We know, it was, we know that's the area. That's where it was. That's the spot. So big deal. Now, he does all this. He, he, he shares all this with them. He does it by all accounts right. He addresses them in a way they can understand. It's intelligent. It's articulate. Remember, Paul was highly educated under Gamal. He spoke more than one language. He spoke several. So he, he could do this. But look what happened. Verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Now, here's the thing. One of the things that was happening is for, the, uh, for Paul to be able and others to preach the gospel and share, discuss openly the message of Christ in Athens. He knew he would need the approval of, of those at the Areopagus. They would need to say, this philosophy can be taught, this is allowed. And so, so he was looking for that. And so in this presentation, there was more at stake than just saying, Paul, tell us what's going on. There was a lot at stake. And so he left, it says in verse 1 of chapter 18, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And here's what we need to know. By all, by all appearances, he did not get it. He didn't get the approval. He didn't get the sign off. He didn't get the permit. He didn't get the CO. He didn't get, yes, you can come and do this. That's, that's, that does not appear to be what happened. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, he says, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. So he mentions a convert there that's not either one of these uh, in that region of Achaia. So we don't know if that was in, in Athens proper or in that region. But it's interesting, these followed him, but, but he didn't name them as the first converts. So whether they were genuine and, and really sold out or not, we don't know. What we do know is that the message largely seemed to have fallen flat there in Athens, even though he did his very best. They were very wise. They felt they were very intellectual. They were very smart. More about that in just a second. Let's move on in chapter 18 for just a couple of minutes. And it says, and then we'll, we're going to have some opportunity to answer questions. I'm going to give you some application first, then it might help you with some of the frames, some of the questions that you have, but you'll need to start sending those in. And you can start sending those in if you, if you already know what they are. You can start doing that now, and it'd be really helpful if you did, if you already have them. So here we are, Acts 18, verse 1, just a few more verses. After this, Paul left Athens and went on to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they, he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, remember they were coming, he was waiting on them, so now they've come, but in Corinth, they met him. Paul, when they arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justice, a worshiper of God. That would be one who is a Gentile but is worshiping God as a, uh, 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 he's, he's following the Jewish faith uh, as a worshiper of God. He's not Jewish, but he is by faith at that point and following the law and all that that involves. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, 
and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Now, it's very interesting. Then he goes into an attack. But I want to stop there for just a second and hit a couple of things for you. So he's there, and so he moves. He's now left uh, uh, Athens. He, he's gone back now over to Corinth. And so we're going to look back at this map for just a second, and we're going to see that what happens. Let me take these. Uh, try to take these things off. There we go. Sorry about that and technology right so i forgot to take my little marks off here but you see corinth now is right here so he's crossed over he's gone to that area he's way off the beaten path and yet now he's where god wants him so there's corinth you see okay now with this in mind look what happens okay he moves to corinth he meets aquila and he says that he is a tent maker he is as he as as, as paul was priscilla and aquila tent makers now tent maker uh, the word for tent maker, by the way, translates tent maker or leather worker, either one. And so this is what he was trained to do, which is a little unusual, but it's what he was trained to do. There's a connection that forms there, and he binds them together. And so in Corinth, he is then able to go forward. He tells the story, he preaches the gospel, and then there's, you know, he, there's rejection of it. But he says, you know what, That's at this point, I'm done because your blood is on your hands. There's a, there's a point that he says, I, that's it. And then God confirms it. Christ comes to him and confirms to him after the leader in the synagogue is, uh, is converted. Then the Lord speaks to him and just gives him this confirmation. He says, hey, this, you're in the right place, and I'm going to continue to bless you, and I'm going to continue to use you, and you're where you need to be. Now, let me give you some application for this. And then again, if you have questions, you can send those in, okay? But you need to start to do that. So, I mean, if you have them. So here we go. First, okay, when you as a Christian are rejected, let's talk about rejection. It is incredibly painful, but you're in good company, okay? What I need you to see is sometimes we're rejected. It's our fault because we present the message poorly. We're wrong. We're out of God's will, so forth. There's a number of reasons. But sometimes you're doing the right thing, and it still just doesn't work. It's not the time, and it's not the place, and it's all a part of what God is doing or allowing to be done. So when you feel as a Christian, wow, they're rejecting me. What's wrong with me? Understand that the Apostle Paul, when he was in Athens, they rejected him. And I don't mean just the people chasing him, the, the Jews that didn't like his message. I don't know the people of Athens just largely said, yeah, we're just not interested you're kind of below us. This doesn't make any sense. We don't want that. So when you're rejected, just please remember, you're not alone. Okay, you're not alone. It doesn't always mean that something horrific has happened here. It just means that God is not at work at that time, or he's using that, remember, to detour you, detour you to somewhere else to get you to where he wants you to be, and they're not willing to receive the message. The other thing I want you to see is that there are times when you look at this, you know, he went to he went to Athens and the people in Athens were really, um, you know, if you were in the if you were in the Areopagus, you were somebody. You were the upper echelon and you knew it. You spent all day. Think about this. You spent all your day of philosophy and discussions and so forth. So what does this mean? You don't have to work in the fields. You have the funds to do that. You have people that are doing it for you. You have the op You have the education to do it. On every level, they're in the upper class. There's nothing wrong with being in the upper class, but sometimes, you know what? Average is okay. And when I say average, I know that's a bad word, it seems, but it means we should strive to be our best, but we shouldn't be taken with people just because of what they have or their abilities or their past or whatever. We all have value to God. You have value to God. And he does amazing things. You know, there may be some of you tonight, and you look at this and you're like, man, God could never use me. I, I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. Or I haven't had the right pedigree. I haven't had my life the way it should be. I've messed up too much. Can I just share a passage with you? In 1 Corinthians 1, 18, it says through 25, it says this. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the, intelligent, uh, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. 
where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made the foolish made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since it is the wisdom of God, the world through for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who do believe. Jews demand a sign, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Now, why did I share that with you right here? For a couple of reasons. One, Paul wrote that, inspired of God, to the church at Corinth after he had been in Athens, after he had dealt with the philosophers, after he had dealt with the upper echelon, after he dealt, and they rejected the gospel. But then he goes to Corinth, and Corinth is kind of known as a seedy, well, it is. It's known as a very seedy place. And it's a worldly place. You, you didn't go to Corinth to get a great education, okay? Nobody probably wanted to graduate from the University of Corinth, all right? You went to Corinth for a lot of other reasons. Corinth was Las Vegas of the day uh, times a couple of times. So more about that later. But it, 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 was, it was not the place you vacation with the family and do all this. But there were people that lived there, lots of people. And he went there, and you know what? They were not known as the center of wisdom in the world, but they were open to the gospel because they were hurting and they were willing to hear. So Paul, God used that in him and inspired and said, you know what? The, the, here's how it goes. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And so he says, you know what? This, this is okay. We Don't be attracted to someone because of what they have or what they know, but see everyone as the potential for Jesus Christ. Because the wisdom of God is what we really need. And that's what you need and I need this week. So I don't know what kind of decisions you're making this week. I don't know what you face this week. But I know that we have a lot of people today that are claiming to have wisdom. I saw some today, some things today that, that I watched and saw that was referenced to. And people were claiming wisdom. That there wasn't wisdom at all. But then on the other hand, I've seen people that through a childlike faith can trust God and follow him with wisdom. And he can guide them right through everything. So don't feel like God cannot guide you. Don't feel like because of your past, you can't achieve more. And I don't mean money and fame and all this stuff of the world. I'm saying that God cannot use you because he can. And so don't let it be. The, the wisdom of God is what you need in your life and, and not a lot of other fake stuff. You need God's wisdom in your life, and he will guide you through all of that. As a matter of fact, it also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said, I came to you in weakness with great fear to the Corinthians, I came to you in weakness and great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Now, look what he said again. He said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. Okay, now, next time you read that in 1 Corinthians 2, 3 through 5, please remember this. When he says, my message was not with persuasive words, where had he just come from before going there? Athens. What was he doing in Athens? Wise and persuasive words. No doubt he felt like he failed in Athens. Okay, But when he came to Corinth, he retooled and he said, I'm not going to try to do that. I'm going to just say the simple truth of this. And he was, he was humbled by that. And that's not a bad thing. So does that mean he made a mistake over here? I don't think so necessarily. It's just part of the learning process. And so God used it. And he said, I came to you. There's a different level of humility with Paul when he came to Corinth than there was with Paul in Athens. Okay? So God used him in that way. When we humble ourselves and we allow God to teach us to learn from what has happened, God can use us. You've had a rough week. You've had to, this has been the best week for me either. But if you've had a rough week and different things like that and people attacking you, let's learn from that and say, God, let's allow him to humble us. But it doesn't mean he's done with us. It means he may be preparing us for a field where he can really use us. So, so when we looked at all that rejection. You're not alone. Average is okay because we're depending on God and not just on ourselves. There's a point he dusted his feet to move on. I could talk about that more maybe next week. 
Uh, there's a point to stop trying if God's not in it, move on. But then there's also a point to stay. When Christ affirmed, hey, I'm with you right here, you stay. When God is at work, you just stay put. And so that's what you want to see. And, uh, and then what did he do? He adapted from one place to the other. He learned and adapted. More about that next week. And I encourage you this week with whatever you are. It doesn't mean quit, but it means adapt and look at what God is teaching you. So these are all things that we, as a, at a minimum, that we learn from this passage, which actually is a rejection of Paul in many ways at the upper echelon, and yet God used it, and he goes to Corinth where you would think nobody cares about God, and they're open to the gospel. And Corinth's going to have a lot of problems, okay, down the road, but they're going to have problems because of where they came from. But they genuinely seem to have come to the Lord, and so it's, it's very exciting about that. So I hope that that will be an encouragement to you as well. Now, we've got some questions. If you have any others, we've got several here. I'm going to try to start uh, answering some of these. And so, again, if you want to ask something related to any of this about the rejection, being average, the wisdom, uh, about adapting, about God moving or staying put, it's all those kinds of whatever, uh, or something I haven't thought of, which is probably plenty related to this, then send it in right now, and we'll try to respond to those. Okay, so here we go. Which Bible version are you reading from? I'm reading from, uh, right now, the New International Version. And so this one is the one that was, because they've made different ones. And I'm trying to remember, this one was published in, what was it? Um, originally, it was the, I think the 78 version is the best, but they don't do it anymore. And so this is the 2011, I think, version that I have. And one thing that they do is when they stop, when they start publishing a new version, they stop the others so you can't get them anymore. Don't like that, but that's what it is. So it's the it's the NIV. Okay, New International Version. Uh, all right, uh, let's see here. Were there other churches besides the one in the epistles, uh, Corinthians, Ephesians, etc., that never made it to one of Paul's letters? Well, okay, great question. So were there other churches besides the ones in the epistles, Corinthians? Which, yeah, almost certainly. For, so for example, remember that back when the second missionary journey started, uh, and we were back in, uh, what were we back in, yeah, in Acts 15, where originally Paul, in verse 36, Paul and, uh, said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the churches. They had their, their separation. What happened then in verse 39 was that Barnabas took Mark, or John Mark, with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left and then picked up Timothy along the way. So we're now tracking with, by the Holy Spirit's choice, with Paul and Silas, tracking Paul primarily, and the churches that he's connecting with. It does not track with Barnabas and with John Mark, but they're still going to those churches, and no doubt there were other churches that had been started and were started as a result. So great question. So yes, there were. Also, you should know that when you say, when you mention Corinthians and Ephesians, uh, and, and we're about to hit uh, Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, uh, but when it says the church at Corinth or the church at Ephesus, it started as one group, but then there were multiple, you know, home churches. We would say multiple churches all over those regions. So it was more than just one church. There were multiples in those regions. So they would write and address those churches in that region. So very good question. And so we have uh, this other question is, uh, you mentioned, and again, uh, last appeal. If there's anything else you want to ask this, you, because we won't keep asking. Uh, you mentioned rejection for, you mentioned rejection. Let me read this. For someone who is sharing their faith could continue. Re okay. You mentioned rejection. For someone who is sharing their faith, could continual rejection mean that we are on onto something and should keep going even if the enemy is against us? Hmm. Great question. So could continual rejection mean we're on to something and should keep going even if the enemy is against us? Eh, you know, yes and no. I mean, if it's continual rejection, so, so for instance, let's go back to the passage that I just was reading uh, uh, back in 18, Acts 18, and we're in verse 6. So in verse 6, Paul was rejected and said, you know what, he's, he's being rejected there by... Um, those that oppose Paul, right? And so he says, your blood be on, on your own heads. I'm innocent up from now and I'll go to the Gentiles. And then it says he left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, worshiper of God. And then Crispus, the synagogue leader in his entire household, believed in the Lord. Many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed were baptized. 
So in that case, I think that's part of the answer to your question. And that is, Paul was not having success with them, and he said, okay, there's enough. That's, that's, that's it. There's, there's a point at which to call it and say this isn't working. And so he had the opportunity to look for another opportunity to adapt. So next door was uh, um, the uh, uh, Ty- Titus Justice, who was a worshiper of God. He was next door to the synagogue. He said, you can meet here. He says, great. So he goes next door. So now people are coming there. And so they don't have the problem with the Jews. He's free to teach in the synagogue, rather. And so then what happens is as he's over there, this uh, Crispus, the leader, the synagogue leader, which was a lay position but highly esteemed, apparently had a choice to make. So he could no longer just go to the synagogue and hear Paul. He had to make a choice. He made the choice and went over to hear Paul. And no doubt that was a major factor in the success of what was happening. So I said all that to say this. When you are sharing your faith and there's continual rejection of your message, I would not assume automatically that means you're on to something you should keep going. I would say, Lord, am I doing something wrong? Should I, should I adapt my method? So I learn, should I learn how to be a better presenter of the gospel? What am I doing wrong? I would try to go and get some wisdom from someone that knows uh, one of the pastors here or something to try to help you so that you can be a more effective witness. Now, when you do everything that you're doing, you're being effective and you're learning and you're doing those kind of things, be respectful of people. If it's still not working, then I would pray and say, Lord, am I trying to witness with your power and in agreement with the Holy Spirit? Or am I witnessing without the power and agreement of the Holy Spirit? That's a very critical thing to learn to watch as you're sharing your faith, to learn to watch for the Holy Spirit at work. When you're sharing your faith and when the Holy Spirit is at work and using it, then it can be a powerful thing. But when you're sharing your faith and the Holy Spirit is not at work in the person's heart, it can be not a great thing. It can lay some seeds, some foundation. But if there's a continual rejection, you continue, it can actually work against the gospel going forward. So in that case, Satan can use it as a determinant. So then you could be just, you know, some people get very, I'm not saying you are, but some people get very adamant saying, I'm going to do this because I'm going to do it. And then it becomes, if we're not careful, it becomes more about our own feeling good about ourselves, that we've done something, than it is about the person actually hearing the message. So I would say, if you're continually rejected, I would do a check and say, hey, let me find out. I want to do this for the Lord. Is there anything I'm doing that I need greater wisdom on, I need another perspective on, to be a better vessel and a better tool? And then once you do that, if you still don't see God moving, you say, God revealed to me. And if God reveals to you, hold it, now go over here, then you need to go over there to be that witness and watch for where God is at work. Remember this, sometimes we get fixated on being a witness in this spot, and we're like convinced that's where we need to be. But for whatever reason, God, through the Holy Spirit of God, he's ready to work in someone's heart over here. If, we're not, if we don't learn how to be sensitive to that, we will never go to the person that, that is ready to receive the gospel that God wants to use us to do. We'll stay over here. And then we're not in the will of God. Remember uh, when I shared the message uh, just a couple of weeks ago about the man that God, that Christ healed with the demon. And he said, uh, listen, don't share here. Go back to the priest and share. But what did he do? He went out and told everybody. And so he was determined to tell everybody. He would have said he's a good witness. But that was not God's will and ended up backfiring. So you just want to have a surrender heart to God and let God show you and let God guide you. And that's really, really the key. I know I answered for a long time, but I think that's a great question. One that we should ask and we should all kind of think through as we're trying to be effective witnesses for Christ. By the way, last thing is while you're doing that though, don't get discouraged and stop being any kind of witness. That's not the thing to do either. So it's just being sharpening the tool, you know, so sharpening the tool. All right, here's another one it says, um, uh, is there any evidence? Is there evidence? Is there evidence of any fruit from Paul's visit to the Areopagus in Athens? I believe they did ask him to come back the next day. You know, there's some evidence. Yes, they're, they're, they asked him to. Yes, we don't know what ended up happening from that. You know, ultimately, I mean, there is some indication, and, and I'm glad you said that. It's not like it was a total failure. I think from all appearances, Paul may have thought it was a total failure because he didn't see the reaping that he wanted to see. But I don't think it's a total failure. No, he was invited. There's no sense that he, the only thing that it appears that offended them at any, at any point was when he talked about the resurrection. And according to the scriptures, if the resurrection offends, then that's okay. That's different. 
So, so I, I would agree with you. It's not that it was a total failure. It's just that he didn't see the results that he wanted to see. And so in that case, God used him at best to lay some seed, and I think he did going forward, but he didn't get to see the big harvest he wanted, nor the big open door at that moment that he hoped to see. So very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. And then how do you know, another question is, how do you know when to continue an endeavor that you feel is God's plan when faced with repeated failure? Boy, that's a great question. One more time, the question is, how do you know when to continue an endeavor that you feel is God's plan when faced with repeated failure? So, wow, big question. Okay, so I think, I think one of the things you have to do is the key is you said, you said that you feel is God's plan. And, you know, do you, how do you know when to continue? When you feel it's God's plan. And that is the key. And I'm not getting on to you because we all have to have a sense of feeling that it's God's plan. But we have to kind of go really into that area and really delve in and say, God, you need to show me, is this really what you want? It needs to really be grounded in Scripture. You need, if there, if you're continuing it and there's repeated failure, you need to look at a couple of things. You, you definitely, I mean, I strongly would urge you, you read the Word, but I'm going to assume you're already doing that. You pray, I'm going to assume you're already doing that. If you're doing those two things, you're praying for wisdom and you're reading the Word, then you need to, I would strongly suggest, you need to seek out some good, wise advice from a Christian leader, from someone that knows more than you do on that area. Go and talk to them, or two or three that you tr- that, that really you know are trustworthy and that will be honest with you, and then consider what they have to say to you and, and, and take it in and consider, because they can see things, you know, as any third party can, they can see things that you might not be able to see. And so many times when people come and ask for wisdom like that and they hear something, it's not what they want to hear, and then they don't receive it. So you'd want to pray and say, God, help me be able to receive it. You say, well, I don't know if they're telling the truth. Well, then don't go. If you, if you can't, you know, trust them, you don't go. You know, one time um, uh, we had a situation happen and, uh, and I was questioning whether to change a, a particular a physician. And so the problem was, uh, was a diagnosis that was given that was potentially really not good uh, that was given to my wife, but I saw the same doctor and originally had sent her to that doctor. And I really liked the doctor. And I was, I was shocked at what, what ended up happening you know, with her. So I, it's odd as it sounds, you know, I would, I was, I had to go to see this kind of doctor, get this specialist, and uh, and and so I, I didn't know if I should go somewhere else, and I really, f- I felt this weird connection because it just felt like this is where I should be, and yet I had a struggle. So I talked with my, with with my primary doctor about it, and you know, the primary doctor gave me some great great advice. So they listened to me, and I said, I don't know what to do about this. And they turned around, and looked at me, and they said, you should change doctors. And I said, you really think so? And, and the doctor said, absolutely. And I said, okay, all right, wow. And then, and then the doctor looked at me and said, do you know why? And I said, why? And the doctor said, you should change doctors because you've lost confidence in the doctor. You've lost confidence in that physician. And he said, and that's understandable. And for that reason, he said, it's not a judgment of whether it's a good doctor or not, but you've lost confidence in that physician. You need to go to a different doctor. And I took that advice and immediately did that because that was wise advice. I had not seen it from that perspective. So he separated whether the doctor made a mistake or didn't or is or doesn't or whatever. But he just said, you've lost confidence in that. So when you seek out that wisdom, when you seek out that advice, make sure it's someone that you will trust and have confidence in and listen to them and be able to help you evaluate whether Because so many times we continue to determine God wants to do this. That it just isn't working. I, one more thing. There's so many times that we have a burden to do something, uh, but God is not blessing it. And he's not called us to do it. Remember, there's a difference between a burden and a calling. So I see this with people going in ministry a lot of times. It's like, you know, I, I just feel like, you know what, I just, this is what God wants me to do, but there's no fruit. There's no blessing. There's no indication it's what God wants to do. So you have to be open to see sometimes maybe your direction is not God's direction or it's not God's direction at that time. So separate the burden and the calling of God in your life or whatever this decision is. That's a critical thing too. Someone else can help you make that decision or at least give you some wisdom uh, toward that. Okay, and if we can help here, you let us know and you contact, we'll see what we can do. Uh, Here's another one, and that is... 
Okay, so someone is wondering, uh, does Living Faith uh, teach biblical evangelism and do evangelistic outreach? Well, yes, we do. And so uh, I'm going to assume you're new or maybe haven't visited here or whatever. That's a big deal to us to reach people for Christ. It's a major thing to us. That's why we do our live streams. It's why we built the facility that we have and invested millions of dollars, but also because we want to invest and encourage people constantly to be witnesses for Christ. We're very blessed here. I think I think uh, uh, we talk about this as a staff a lot, that in our church we feel like, we hope and feel like, that is part of our DNA here to reach people, to to uh, to see brand new people come in. We get excited about that, about the life change. That's, that's part of why we do everything we do. So I would certainly hope that we communicate that. But that is very much of the DNA uh, here at Living Faith. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to try to put us above anybody else, but, I'm, but I am going to say, in all honesty, I don't think, and I've been associated with a lot of places and in ministry a long time, I, I don't think that is necessarily in the DNA of every place. And, but here, it, it genuinely is, not just in my heart, in Pastor Mark, Pastor Steve, and all the pastors and our staff, everybody's here. That's why we do what we do to try to help people grow and ultimately bring glory to God through reaching people for Christ. Our mission statement alone says we exist to reach people across Long Island, and now it's even more, and guide them to live as his disciples for the glory of God. I mean, that's, our, that's, our, that's what we're about. So absolutely, that's what we're about and what we believe in. And biblical evangelism, interesting uh, term, correct term, but interesting term, because we want to do it as close to and as correct with the scriptures as we possibly can. And as Paul was doing here, his evangelism was relevant. It was relevant to Corinth. He spoke to the people in Corinth one way, but he spoke to the people in Athens the other, and to the point of the person, whoever it was that asked the other question, still in Athens, God used it. His approach in Philippi was different still. Remember, in Philippi, he showed up with the women uh, there at the place of prayer and began talking with them and then led them to Christ in a whole different conversation. In Thessalonica, it was a different conversation. Now in Athens, completely different. Now it goes to Corinth, it's completely different. So he changed and became what he needed. Because he didn't change the message, but he, he was able to flex and bend and meet people where they were. Remember, biblical evangelism is going to focus on Jesus Christ for and, and the, the corrigment of the gospel, the basics of the gospel, and not alter that. Is salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone and, and the word of God and the repentance. But it's also going to care about communicating to the person that the message is going out to. And so that's extremely relevant. It needs to be relevant. You don't have to make it relevant, but you just have to not get in the way of it being relevant. And so that's, I think, a biblical witness. Jesus talked to the woman at the well, how? We talked about her just a few days ago. And how did he do? He started off with water. Give me some water to drink because she was at the well. That was the perfect thing. So when our evangelism is out of context, when it's just like hitting somebody in the face, I don't think that's biblical evangelism. I think it's just evangelism we're trying to do, like almost sales. But biblical part of that is being sensitive to the person and the Holy Spirit and so forth. So hopefully, yes, we hope that that is certainly what we're about. And then we support missions, of course, just like last week when we had the interview with Mike. And we support missionaries dozens and dozens and dozens all over the world to spread the gospel. And we're excited about that. And Mike on our staff reminded me of that, which is very true. And we absolutely do that. To that end, uh, let me remind you that we're going to be uh, 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 checking in with Mike again, as I said at the first of our stream tonight. And we're going to check in with Mike uh, and Julianne. And hopefully they get back to Kiev and we'll do a checkup and find out what's happened with them. I told Post. Spoke to him about that today. We're also talking about some other connections that may be kind of cool. Uh, that Mike, uh, with our students and, and so forth, we're talking about that. You'll learn more about that uh, or, or, or those that are connected with that will. And then, uh, and then the other thing I want to remind you about is we have another interview that we're going to be doing. And so that is coming up. I mentioned it last week, so tonight I can tell you for sure. That will be on March the 1st, and so that's a month from now, and, or almost a month from now. So March the 1st. On that night, uh, for the first time, we'll be interviewing uh, a pastor, which is Pastor Nehru Grant. And Pastor Nehru from uh, Living Hope Christian Church, Living Hope Church in Belarus. And in Belarus. And so that is going to be cool. And so our plan is to actually go there and do all of this, uh, uh, their, their, uh, their site that night. And he's had um, a, a really uh, unusual path in the last year. 
and face, faces some amazing challenges and yet has great faith and, and is just continuing to pastor. And, and I just want you to have the chance to meet him and hear from him and, and, and hear what he's walking through and see if that can help you walk through whatever you're walking through. And you will understand when we talk and meet, and, and, and I'd rather you hear it from him. Then we've got some others that we're lining up right now that we're excited about. But that one comes up on March the 1st in just a few weeks. So I hope that you'll be with us for that. And then also we have, of course, this Sunday at 9 and at 11. And we're going to be uh, talking about Ask the Right Question, which is uh, really cool. And so sometimes we go to God with the questions and it's not until we ask the right one that we really get the answer. All right. And so this week we're going to wait and see what happens here in New York State and Nassau County. And so we may be able to make some announcements to you about what's coming up for even for this Sunday. We hope so. We'll see what happens. But in the meantime, I pray that God blesses you and um, uh, and I pray that God will be with you. I've got one. I see one last question that just came in kind of late. Let me see if I have a second. Uh, yeah. The question is, how will I know when God wants me to do something? That's a really big question. Uh, so it's hard to answer in 30 seconds, but I think, uh, I think the quick, unfair, quick, broad stroke answer is if God is burdening you, if there's a burden you cannot get away with, uh, get away from, and if that is burdening you, as long as that burden is within the confines of Scripture, as long as it's consistent with the Word of God, then there's, a, there's something there going on. And at a minimum, you want to pray, read the Word, and then maybe consult if you, if you need to in this quick, short answer and say, hey, I need to get some feedback on this. I need to get some wisdom on this. Am I interpreting this correctly? If you're not sure if it's God, then you want to be careful about going forward. But if you can't get away from it and it's very biblical and it's very sound, you want to consider that one and take it the next step to try to see what God wants you to do. The main thing is do not read into something that God is a, that God doesn't affirm in his word and say, I think God wants me to do that because it feels right. Be careful of that. So you want to make sure it's grounded, solid. And again, then get some wisdom. Let us help you. And I'm sorry, that's the shortest that's the amount of time. So that's the answer I can give you to try to pull it together. Call, see if we can help you. We'll be glad to do that. Again, I hope to see you next Tuesday. I hope to see you on Sunday, 9 and 11. I hope you come here, and it's going to be fantastic. God's going to bless. Father, thank you for all you've done this night and for the people that are watching and a part of this study and asking questions. Bless them, I pray, and may you be glorified. In Christ's name we pray, and all the people said, would you say amen? Thank you so very much. All right, God bless. Thanks for letting me in tonight.